Um, so I think uh, since I'm hosting, co-hosting with my wonderful colleagues here, um, I just wanna welcome, welcome you all today and to say that we're sort of thinking this like a wrap session for you all to express a little of how you're feeling if you've been involved with social media, bigger picture issues that we don't normally think about necessarily every, every day, but some of us have actually been thinking about these things for a long time. And now because we've all slowed down or stopped um, performing, running around, going to school, that we have more time on our hands to address some of these issues. Um, obviously there's the pandemic, which has slowed us down. And then there are all the other issues going on around the country that we've been thinking about. Um, I just have to say that I'm really impressed by all, all of you students. Uh, you give us a lot of inspiration by your incredible um, ability to adapt. I've been very impressed with all, everybody. Um, I've personally gone through a lot of phases in the last three months. Um, it started with just the pandemic and felt like about survival and safety. And the last thing on my mind was music um, or practicing. And then I think we've all sort of evolved in these months to getting into routines. Those of us who teach, you know, went right back to teaching. So we were all kind of learning together, learning about how to use social media, how do we use Zoom, all of these things. Um, but I found for myself that over this time, I've had a lot of time to reflect, to listen to people, what they're saying, what they're talking about. And I certainly have my own story of, um, you know, I play in the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, for example, and um, one of my passions is something called Reflections, where we've created this program where we go into communities. Um, it's all people with Alzheimer's and dementia. It's older people. And we go in there and we perform for them. And I find that the most mo moving thing I do almost in music these days. And when, of course, the pandemic happened, it all shut down. And we have now figured a way where the healthcare workers are going, and going in and their nurses and their aides are with them. And we've been performing online. So, I mean, that's just one thing that I've been doing. Um, and then the question is, what's your passion? Is there a bigger purpose to music? Or is music there for just music's sake? And it's hardly just. Is it a reflection of the footprint of the world at large? Um, what, what is music to you? And how does that tie into what's happening? And then classical music is in its own category, because rap has ability to use words and express in different ways. And we as musicians and classical musicians, you know, we can think in a smaller picture way. So I don't know. I have a feeling you all have a lot on your mind. And I have just sort of talked a lot just about some of the things I've been thinking about. And I find it helpful to hear what everybody else has to say about some of these issues they've been thinking about and how they're feeling and how they're using their music, how they've used their music before, and if anything's changed for them since we've started this time. Um, I don't know if any of the faculty wants to join in and express a little what they've been thinking. Um, and then I'm really look forward to hearing just anything you're feeling or <coughs> these days. Uh, well, thanks, Liz. I, I can just weigh in as, as everyone's collecting their thoughts and um, just say that I, I continue to um, be thankful for music. It's, uh, as you say, this time of, of reflection and unnatural disconnection um, has felt really different. It's different um, from anything that any of us has experienced in our lifetimes. Um, and it's not only what's happened in the last few months, but also uh, a lot on our minds is how do we move forward from this? When does concert life come back and how does it come back? Um, what are um, ways that we can, uh, I hope that we're not um, stuck in Zoom land for very much longer because I just, um, I'm frustrated by it, frankly. I'm, I'm appreciative of technology, but uh, it's frustrating. Um, I was, some of you joined when we were just finishing up some um, 
chit chat and you know Toby was was talking about um, the joy of finally getting into a room and hearing actual instruments other than computer speakers and microphones. Um, so, so I look forward to that, but it's very unclear what um, concert life is going to be from now on. Um, and I also think a lot about, uh, and I, I've just been noticing this more and more with uh, the generation of the View Fellows, people, um, uh, musicians, thinking about um, going to perform. There's a project of a recent uh, Eastman graduate who cared about uh, the environment and put together a whole series of concerts in the national parks. We got some um, publicity for that. Uh, we were just mentioning that uh, there is, I think, um, I think this is the person that we, that we were talking about, but uh, a New York based violinist named Kelly Hall Tompkins, who also um, I knew at Eastman when she was an undergrad there, who has um, been for a long time now, and this is excellent, you know, the longevity of it and the willingness to stick with it. Um, playing in soup kitchens and homeless shelters and finding a lot of meaning there. Um, I was meeting with uh, one of your fellows, um, fellow fellows, um, Ritu. I, I don't see her on the call right now, uh, violist. And she was really excited to talk about a project that she's been doing where she teaches music in a men's prison. So I, I just have to say that I, um, you know, all, all of the recent uh, events aside um, where a certain a certain side of, of social responsibility has suddenly, you know, come to the fore. Um, but I take a lot of uh, encouragement that there are many of you who have been doing this. It's not just a reaction to the last few weeks, but that you've been doing this, that you've sought ways to make yourselves as a human being and as a musician connect to your communities in, in um, deep ways. I, I love that. You know, Phil, you're talking about um, how um, many of these uh, ideas to merge our art with uh, certain social causes predated what's happened more recently. I myself have not, I, I'm just like maybe beginning to figure out how to adapt uh, my actual music making and to the current environment. Um, my wife, Aida Yoshioka, she's a violinist has worked a lot in new music and uh, she's actually honestly been much more involved uh, with certain social change and such like this in her music making. And uh, it's been interesting for me to, to watch some of the groups she's been involved with, Son Sonora. And uh, actually she and I are, are playing some recitals uh, that are going out to the, some of the hospital workers and patients these days. But, uh, one of the groups I just wanted to mention she worked with uh, is called Ensemble Pi, P-I. She works closely with this Israeli pianist, Edith Meshelin. And Edith has, has felt very passionately about a lot of things for a long, long time. Um, I remember the, the day after the 2016 presidential election, she had a Black Lives Matter concert. There are environmental um, projects she's put on. She's dealt with mass incarceration too and gone to the prisons and, and uh, reparations. She'll often have, she'll put on a concert and bring in um, sometimes celebrity speakers like ta Coates or Naomi Wolf or bring in prisoners or uh, I guess my takeaway from what she's done is that uh, again it's not just something that developed rapidly. This was a deep, these were certain deep causes with her. And I think um, it's something that has to be taken upon yourself if you want to to bring more awareness to some of these things. It has to be something you feel passionate about, you yourself want to educate yourself about and share this with. I mean, to, to raise funds, but in particular to to bring awareness to where you see change is needed. I can speak now to um, probably a, um, a program that 
maybe many of you are familiar with the sort of global El Sistema program, which started in, in uh, Venezuela about 35 years ago to, uh, to provide music possibilities for children in, in barrios and extreme poverty and, and uh, definitely the definition of an underserved community. And it has mushroomed. Um, so I th don't know, there are many, many programs around the world now. <clears throat> of course, Gustavo Dudamel of the, the Los Angeles Philharmonic is one of their sort of star uh, products of that extraordinary program. Um, and he's, they do in Los Angeles a lot of work. Um, I was sort of thinking about or what John was saying and Liz of something that's been in my life for a long time of being of a particular political bent and, and looking at um, the injustices of music education in schools. I live in a city that's quite segregated and like many big cities, the school, the public schools are not funded at the level of the suburban schools. That's another topic. I won't go into it right now, but the music education that's that's available to those children is, is extremely um, limited. And so I moved to Buffalo, New York, which is one of um, a city, a very poor city. I think it's the third poorest city in the United States. Um, and, uh, and so I was at a time of my life that I, I felt this way for a long time and there was a, an opportunity. And so I started a Nelson Stemmer program about six years ago, co-founded it with a couple of other women and I um, resigned as executive director. And if anybody's interested about fundraising, there's one more class about that in entrepreneurship on uh, Tuesday, I think. And I can speak a little bit more to that. But my passion of, of my love of music and my belief in its sort of transformative uh, music as a universal language, if you, if you believe in that, um, I felt could be, I could, I could help um, a particular group of, of a population in Buffalo. Buffalo had a big um, immigration of refugees in the last 20 years. And so we were just in the place where uh, a school that um, we, we started a program that started with 15 kids and is now up to 75 kids. And they have music and, and we learn two things. I learned two most things about that. My experience with that is A, I learned um, that we taught them Western songs, but we've also now much more teach them songs from their own country and K-pop songs and Burmese songs and African songs. And so, so we weren't just coming in with our thing, but we were coming in to be a part of the community. And I think the biggest thing, the biggest joy for me was to get to know these families. And maybe that's a little bit of our, of our current, the last three weeks of, what can we do with our music? And we may be in a particular box and we want to get out of that box. And, and for me, spending so much time in that community and going into people's houses and seeing how they live and what their stories and what their history is and was, I understood it and was humbled by it. And then I, they, I, there was trust, there's mutual trust after a couple of years that I wasn't just coming in, but I was part of the, of the group. And, and that for me was, that's, that changed my life and I'm very grateful to have been able to have that experience. So spreading music and spreading and, 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 uh, and getting understanding at the same time. And I think many LC Stema programs, I'm not advocating you go out and start your own right now because it's uh, difficult to start anything at the moment, but something to think about whether volunteering for an organization like this or or learning more about it, taking the time to go to LC Stema USA, and they've got a lot of information on their website about um, the wonderful work. So. I'd be curious to know what, what you guys, you younger people are already doing, uh, going out into the communities, and uh, what are your plans for going forward? If you're in school, are schools starting up um, in the fall? online or are some of you going to be in situations where there's going to be a partial um, um, live uh, lessons in chamber music and uh, something else that's different in different parts of the country but I'm also curious what what have you already been doing in the area that we've been talking about Well, I, I, I go to Indiana University and um, some classmates of mine recently started a petition to urge our school administration to start to um, act on a lot of the, the well-meaning 
um, messages they've been sending out about solidarity with um, communities of color in the music world. Um, and we've all been talking about what an extraordinary opportunity we have in front of us now um, because the music world is inevitably changing. Um, it's an opportunity to create more substantive changes and urge our conservatory administrations to um, make the changes at the level, at, at an educational level. Like so, so before we enter our professional lives, we um, are already cognizant of what we need to do to try and make the classical music world a more accessible place. Um, and, and what we're doing with this petition is specifically trying to push for um, a broader programming, um, adding more classes to the curriculum that focus not just on Western art music, but also Afro-diasporic music traditions. And um, it, I just think it's, it's sort of serendipitous that um, we have this time to delve into to these ideas and try to push ourselves to, um, to broaden our own um, understanding of the, the music world we inhabit and, and try to um, use this time for that. I think that's fantastic. I really do. I think that's um, something that we should kind of all be doing and thinking about what we can do um, because of the look of classical music um, is uh, is very centric, you know, and um, and I think it's great that you're doing that. So uh, I, I really, it's amazing this time off has uh, really made us, I mean, as I said, some of us have opened our eyes. I mean, it's interesting, my, um, my whole fault, what just was announced today, I live in New York, um, that Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center are closed the rest of the year till next year. Um, so my whole season is canceled, and our opening of Orpheus was Valerie Coleman and Monty Wins. We piece was written for them, and and actually the first concert was geared towards Black Lives Matter, and um, um, and now that's all canceled. And so um, just going into education and going into places, you know, trying to figure it out is, um, I think it's, it. I, I do feel it's kind of our responsibility wherever we can look. So I. I applaud you for that and it's fantastic so um. actually I have a question for all of the faculty I'm really curious about um, maybe people you've worked with in your musical careers um, that inspire you and the way they interact with um, um, because I've been I've been reading a little about what Teddy Abrams is doing in, with the Louisville Orchestra and I'm really inspired by um, sort of his model of community engagement and um, broadening his audience that way. Um, I'm wondering if, if any of you have other, other models of that sort of um, engagement with, with the audience. Any of the faculty want to speak on this? Um... I mean, I can say, I can say something. You know, being in the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra and and the Orchestra of St. Luke's in New York, um, our organizations have long been involved in outreach programs. We have a whole school um, in the inner city that we have a younger players, um, not myself, but many of my students and younger players are involved. Um, so it's often with, done through organizations, uh, and. There's an interesting double-edged sword. I'm going to be very uh, upfront about this. Um, Orpheus got a very big grant to be um, more inclusive in the orchestra. And um, I don't want to say that we said we look too one-dimensional of the look of representing the whole America and what we look like. And um, we got a grant, and, um, and we brought in a lot of African-American players. And, but we didn't bring anybody in who wasn't you know, we just brought in players. And some of the players actually felt that they were, um, they talked about tokenism. That's a, lot, a big word that's been out there. And it's, 
you know, I've been doing so much listening to what people are saying. Um, it's not an easy thing to talk about, actually, and to deal with. And I was even thinking in the class today, this is something, you know, um, I do feel it's all of our responsibility to and just be um, inclusive. So we have programs, and, and I feel like we should be doing even more, you know, than we do. But... Um, on a personal level, how you deal with that, you know, if you're not an orchestra or you're a student, um, I think exactly what you were talking about is a great way it is to go to your school, you know, and see what can I do. Um, it's the first step. Anybody else or any of the students? I really want to hear, you know, from the students what they have to say and what they're thinking about because um, I love hearing you speak. I think there's a lot on your mind. Anybody else there? I can talk. Um, oh, sorry. That's okay. Go for it. Okay, sorry. Um, I feel like uh, what you're saying about tokenism is like interesting because similar to Hannah, our school's been having these kind of like nightly safe space meetings where people discuss their experiences as like um, students of color in at Shepherd. And um, they are writing a petition to the school about including more diverse programming. And it's kind of interesting because I feel like a lot of big American orchestras, the response has been like, for example, the Philadelphia Orchestra was celebrating women. So they did one concert, all women composers, women conductor. That was it for like the whole year, pretty much. And I feel like that kind of others, the kind, the kind of music that should be just included in the repertoire. And the way you make something part of like the musical canon is to just play it a lot. And, you know, in a bunch of different orchestras on subscription programs. And I've been thinking a lot about the role of like orchestras as institutions in racial diversity and just community in general. And I feel like somewhere there's become like a shift from an orchestra as a community service organization, which I think it really can be, to a very exclusive kind of upper tier organization, not just in who's represented on the stage, but the audience as well. I'd say the most diverse concerts I've ever been to have been free ones in the city. Like the orchestra goes to an open air space and play stuff. And there's so many people who come out for those concerts. And like, there's so many people and it's outdoors, but it's like dead silent. Everyone's listening to the music. And I just feel, I know part of it is funding, but I think that orchestras could take a step to be more proactive in including whole communities and being a community um, organization instead of this like specialized thing. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's great. And I, I just um, make a, a couple of comments that from listening to you and listening to Hannah. Um, you guys are going to be the ones who are, are going to be change agents as you move into this world. Um, I love the idea that, that you're pushing for um, curricular change and programmatic change to help prepare you. I just want to put a plug in for um, not, not only filling your heads with knowledge, which is really easy to do in school and important. I don't want to diminish it at all. Um, but also um, make sure that you and your spirit stay connected to music because as, uh, I encourage you just to always find that, that, that healthy balance between you as, as a musician and you as a social activist and that you have a really um, strong artistic and musical anchor that informs what you do and uh, allows you to see how it's relevant to the community um, and not just do something because, uh, because I mean, all I'm saying is like, don't compromise your art, don't put yourself in a, a position that um, doesn't also have high artistic value and, um, and affirm artistry over just doing something, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And also to um, look for ways, even now, to gain more perspective. 
uh, and experience. I know you are where you are in school and, and part of perspective and experience is, is living life. But there are ways to do it now where you get out and you play for communities. I know for myself that um, coming right out of music school and the start of my career was going to rural Iowa, a town of 2,000 people, and suddenly saying, um, what do we do? These people don't care about string quartets. They've never heard string quartets. <laughs> How do we connect to them? What's, what's relevant about, about what I do and, and why should they care about it? And uh, I, I just started, I, I know myself and my colleagues, we just started you know, spouting off knowledge and giving them music history lessons. And that's really not, I mean, that's, Ginny was talking about that a little bit. It's um, much deeper than that. It's the, the human connection. And so marrying a, a, a real res respect and desire for human connection with artistic judgment and, a, and, a, and an anchor in, in your artistic selves um, is something that I wanted to add to the conversation. Sue Cahill has her hand up. Hey, hey everybody, I'm, I'm totally Zoom bombing, crashing this thing, and I'm, I'm gonna leave my video off because I'm getting ready actually to drive up to Colorado Springs and it's a wreck in here. But um, I just wanted to respond to the person, um, I'm sorry, I can't now remember who asked about what, what we were doing as faculty. And um, I, I guess I have to point out that since I work in a collaborative orchestra and we have nine musician members, on our, on our board, um, that when I sit on the artistic committee, which I have many times, which is in charge of programming along with Brett Mitchell and all the other folks at the CSO, um, that's one of the big discussions we've been having for years. And um, uh, people of color, women composers and conductors, um, this, is, this has been an ongoing discussion. It may not be always in the forefront when you see things come out publicly, but I can uh, promise you that at least in our orchestra, like I said, which is collaborative, um, we push pretty hard on that. And one of the things that um, ends up happening, unfortunately, is economics. Um, when we program a piece for um, uh, either a person of color or a, a woman, our, the audiences they'll they'll sit through from somewhere between six and twelve minutes of a of a new work of anyone, okay. So that's one of our big hoops, our big challenges. So we have to program carefully, and our music director has to be really on board, which he is actually, with the educational aspect. Um, but there are other things that we do. I have a colleague in the symphony, Catherine Beeson, who used to be our education director. She's our assistant principal viola. And she's been doing sensory friendly concerts for years. Um, disability rights is one of my things, uh, one of my passions. And I, I guess I encourage you to choose, choose one boat <laughs> that you're really, it's really a passion for you. That happens to be mine. And so, um, well, aside from women in bass playing, which is another big one, I guess I have too. Um, and so putting on these sensory friendly concerts where autistic, um, intellectually impaired, any, any type of person can come easily is um, something that is going on that you wouldn't see like in a programming note somewhere, you know, you wouldn't see it on a brochure. Um, so I would have a little bit of um, faith and happiness that actually there, there is stuff going on. Um, and sometimes it's behind the scenes and you can't always see it. When it gets up to the level of a music director, then you know it's actually already percolating way through the system of the organization. Um, that's been my experience. So I really encourage you guys to, you know, keep up the good fight and keep uh, pushing on your administrations, especially um, because it's really important work and it's been going on. And now we have, like people have said, this jump off point where we can really um, be more prominent about it. So thanks. Thanks for letting me share, John. Anybody else, any of the students want to share a little what they're thinking about? And you know, it doesn't have to be that you're changing the world. Uh, you know, it just can be, what, what have you noticed during this, this time? And um, has, how has music helped you 
or what have you been thinking about? I mean, ironically, I've been in Maine. I went, I left New York three months ago, and for me, I've actually been appreciating not playing so much and just getting in touch with nature and smelling the, you know, the flowers and the, the birds and um, through the sadness of not playing. Um, but I, I, I feel like, you know, looking ahead, just trying to think of new creative ways to possibly, you know, connect to people, um, whether it's playing like outdoor concerts and playing for your community. And just, I, I was actually thinking of doing a little invite the neighbors, you know, they've been hearing me practice, you know, just sort of say, hey, come on over. Well, you know, Toby, I wish you were here to cook dinner. <laughs> That's one way to bring people together is just have Toby Apple around because he's the best cook I've ever <laughs> experienced, Toby. I'll be right over uh, that. Absolutely, I'll be right there. I, I was just thinking about something that, that uh, I don't know how apropos this is. When uh, my teacher, Max Aronoff, uh, was in the first class at the Curtis Institute when they opened, opened by a, a, a very nice Anglo-Saxon lady whose father had a bunch of money from a publishing company. Um, most of the faculty either were children of or were uh, people who had been, come through the Holocaust and come to the United States and uh, felt that music was important for their family, it was already important and for their children, and sent them to this new free music school in Philadelphia. Uh, by the time I went there 40 years later, uh, I think there was one Black uh, African-American bassoonist um, and maybe two or three uh, Korean pianists, uh, but it was still a very white and, and very Eastern European, uh, the, the, now the children of those people who, who went through, or grandchildren, 40 years earlier, like my teacher had. Uh, I've been at Juilliard now for 30 years teaching, and uh, I am, I'm, I can't tell you how much fun it is to look out at the student body and see that that is simply not the case anymore. And we are educating and graduating a huge population of every type of Eastern culture and uh, a good number of, of African-American students. And uh, it's, it's, these are the people who are gonna go out and really have an opportunity to change things uh, in a better way, uh, a multicultural, a multiracial, multi everything way. Uh, I also, I grew up in a community in a teeny tiny little town in Southern New Jersey where our family was one of two Jewish families in the community. Uh, my sisters claimed that there was anti-Semitism in the school. I never felt it because it never occurred to me that it even existed. I knew what my, my mother had gone through and escaping from Germany and my grandfather was in, a, in a, one, of the, one of the prison camps in Germany. Um, but it, it wasn't in the front of my mind. And I can't, one of the saddest things I think that's going on now is that people of color, of any color, are being discriminated, discriminated publicly on the streets in, um, unfortunately, uh, supported by an administration in this country that uh, uh, is intolerant in every way and unaccepting in every way except if you are white and rich and uh, happen to be uh, of that persuasion uh, politically as well. So uh, I don't know where this is all going except to say uh, we have a responsibility as human beings, not just musicians. Our advantage as musicians is that we can, I think it's important to include the message of, of right and wrong in every way as often as possible in, through our art. I, I have through the years talked to people who feel that it is not our responsibility. You go out and you play your concert, you keep your damn mouth shut. I, I'm sorry, I can't quite uh, accept that. So, anyway, I'll be right over to cook for you, you know, Liz Molnar. Okay, I'm interested, um, Hannah, thanks for, for sharing about talking or, or petitioning your school. 
Um, I'm curious if other fellows have been receiving much in the way of, of dialogue um, from the last few weeks. Um, I, I just tuned into, I finally had some money I could give to my alma mater, finally after many, many decades. And so I got a tote bag and I was, which was great. And I was invited to a really, really wonderful webinar from the Manhattan School of Music about a week and a half ago, where I heard about Kelly, uh, Kelly Hall Tompkins and some other remarkable people on that webinar. And that uh, leader of Manhattan School of Music is a man in answer to someone else's question that I admire greatly. His name is Jim Goundre, and he's the Dean of Manhattan School of Music. He used to be at Roosevelt University in Chicago, and he's an extraordinary guy. And he came out right after, I think, about the second week of the protest saying, okay, Manhattan School of Music will feature a, a piece by an African-American or of the African diaspora on every single concert that they do next year, whether it's a student concert or it's a faculty concert, or, and he just said, you know, we're doing it. This is what's gonna happen. Um, and, and I know him and I know his, he's, all, he's just always looking to do things. So I'm curious about other of you from various schools that you attend, if you've gotten a lot of pushback from what you've been um, asking for or just anybody else besides Hannah about your experience with the student group, you know, dialoguing, forgive me that bad grammar, with your school. Anybody else has anything else to share? Yeah, some maybe not. So, um, hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I'm Ni, nee and I'm going to Stony Brook University. Um, so recently, because of all the issues going on, I think our school, the faculties, have been talking a lot about how to change the curriculum and incorporate more about not just African American culture, but also Asian um, cultures, because. Um, um, and so my teacher, Gil Kalish, he's been, he brought this up and he was saying how um, some of um, the students before had some issues with that. So they are, they're gonna hold um, a meeting between just the students of different studios to discuss about that. And I think um, the solution, um, some of the faculties are saying they will try musicologies or classes, they will try to, um, maybe do more classes on the these issues. Because right now I think we only have um, not that many. Mm -hmm. So I think that's um, just a good way. And also um, with the old social media going on, um, yeah, I don't know, Storybrook, we don't really have that much funding. And I, we just, <laughs> with all the amazing faculties here, we just think the students, we just think that we need to work on the social media more just to um, bring, because we in Long Island, it's, still, it's like two hours from the city. So, um, and in the city, people in the city have so much more access to Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, so all the good concerts. So no one in the city would go to Stonebrook just to watch the concerts, I guess. So um, I don't, I'm just having a question um, for the faculty and the fellows. If do you have any suggestion? I guess because um, yeah, our piano department we are trying to make it more um, known to other students, just to for people to know about study group and to apply to. But um, we we having some trouble with that. I'm not sure where it's going. It just got on my mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it seems like, uh, you know, when, when this all first started, so many people were posting um, on, on, you know, the internet and Facebook and putting videos up. And after a while, it became oversaturated. So it, it just all seemed like just noise for a while. Um, but I think now that we've had some time, there's, there's a place to start thinking. And as you speak, uh, and as Phil said very eloquently, at the end of the day, we have to still follow our, our love of music and our passions, and they have to be real to us. So, I mean, I think 
everybody has a voice and see how you want to use it. So in this case, you might think of getting your, your students, the, the pianists together and putting up some video, you know, and um, you never know what goes viral. It's sort of amazing. Um, and it doesn't cost anything to put things on, on the internet. So, you know, there might be, oh, um, just if you start talking to some of your other colleagues and it, it's uh, even like with my group Orpheus, we're having weekly Zoom meetings and we're, it's like a think tank. We're just trying to think how we're going to move forward, how we're going to get things out there, how we're going to get involved in the community, maybe, you know. So I think possibly um, just dialoguing with your other fellow um, students and that maybe you can, with high quality and intention, um, you, can, you can get heard um, by posting things because it's a, new, it's a new world. And I don't think we're ever going to go completely out of, I mean, we don't want to be on Zoom meetings every day for the rest of our lives. But I, I do think in the interim and, and even moving forward, we, it's a great way to communicate. Um, so you might consider, you know, just like getting a group together. I don't know if that helps at all, but um, something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We actually had a um, Stony Brook piano project if any of you have time, please check that out. <laughs> um, it's kind of our tradition every year that we hold um, maybe all day concerts. Uh, um, so we have different themes every year. This year was Beethoven and we were gonna do all duos, sonatas with uh, piano and strings, but because that did not happen <laughs> because of all of this. So we changed to prelude, all prelude projects. So each of us at our place just um, record something and post on that. So, but thank you. Oh, and I also realized something from this pandemic is my appreciation of the instrument because I'm too, we too used to practicing at school. Um, I play piano. Um, yeah, and now the school is closed. We cannot get access. So I only have a keyboard at home and I just like, I never, I don't think I ever appreciate the real piano this much in my life. <laughs> I have to say, Ni has been posting beautiful performances on her little Yamaha keyboard. It's not even a clavinova. I'm not sure <laughs> what it is, but you've been it's managing wonderfully well. I think for pianists, it's been a particular challenge. I mean, percussionists and, and some others. It's interesting how you say, uh, I wonder if more people have anything to share in terms of there are a lot of certain negative aspects of this, having had to hunker down and becoming frustrated with lacking live performance, but either we're talking about some, it's a great moment for social change and many things seem to have happened or are in the process of happening pretty rapidly, one hopes, and even on, in artistic ways, are there things that you realize from the experience of the, the stay at home and, and what we've done that, uh, I think it may have been even Phil in an email mentioned, are there things that are positives you realize that uh, are worthy of even exploring artistically more and that, that, that came from this, I mean, from, from what we're doing and might change how you uh, proceed in music, even with artistic explorations along with social. Something sure. sort of along those lines. So I um, play in a wind quintet and I also uh, work at a church playing piano and organ. And something that I've uh, been thinking a lot about recently is the meaning that people find in what I do. So with the wind quintet, I think when we go into schools, you know, we make an impact on the kids. But I don't see as much, I guess, connection. We're not achieving that same connection with our adult broader audience. Whereas at church, I've gotten so much like, thank you for continuing to tape these services. Thank you for bringing this to us. We're back to live services now. And since we've gotten back, people are so appreciative of, you know, the things I've been doing every single week for the past few years. Um, but <laughs> all of a sudden they're thinking about it more. Um, and I guess I've been thinking about, you know, why, you know, music is important. I believe that. And I think that, you know, what we do with the quintet is also important, but for some reason, you know, it's when people have that connection at church, when there's more of that obvious, I guess, connection. 
um, it seems to be more meaningful. So I've been thinking about how in Quintet and Symphony and in other parts, um, trying to make that connection just more obvious and relevant for people. And I don't, I don't have an answer. Um, you know, <laughs> it's probably something that a lot of people are thinking about. Um, but it's, it has been interesting to sort of observe that. Madeline, you bring up a really good point and one that I've noticed so many times in, um, in my musical life is that context is huge. Um, and hearing the same music in different contexts can make all the difference. Like I can tell you that one of the, the most memorable performances that I've ever been a part of, of a certain piece, a, a string quartet by Janacek, happened in a psychiatric ward um, because it was a, a different context. And uh, even something like Liz mentioning um, doing an outdoor concert in Maine. <laughs> People are, will come to music um, in a different way than uh, a concert hall. And so maybe that's a healthy thing that will come out of this is um, encouraging us to think of more and more ways to make music uh, in different contexts and being brave and being willing to do it um, not just in the concert hall, although I hope we figure out a way to get back in the concert hall because it's, uh, it's a, a, an important part of our musical lives, but outside of the concert hall um, and that you can gain a lot of artistic satisfaction. Ginny was talking about how much artistic satisfaction she has received from her Buffalo Stringworks program. And all of this um, feeds us as, as musicians. Um, orchestras are starting to figure that out the issue with orchestras is that they're such a large financial institution that there are many competing uh, concerns. Um, Sue Cahill spoke to that, that uh, you got to think about ticket sales and audience sizes and paying um, benefits and, and all of that. So every, I, I, I mean, that's just another challenge to wrestle with. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity now and what John was saying to go into the future with, with this attitude of, of um, being really excited to connect with people in different ways at churches, you know, um, in schools, yes. I mean, that's the value, but definitely other places too. I'd like to ask you a question. I'm Michael Grace. I'm, I'm a music historian, so I'm not exactly one of you all. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about what I can do uh, in my profession, teaching music history classes, uh, to contribute to a better understanding of some of the social issues uh, that we're all uh, struggling with. Um, I can do certain obvious things and I do them. Uh, when I get to the early 19th century, I put a lot more emphasis on Fanny Mendelssohn and Clara Schumann than, uh, than traditionally you would have found in early 19th century music. Uh, or we can spend a lot of time examining Wagner's anti-Semitic views in his uh, music dramas. Or we can look at Don Giovanni as an example of homophobia that's just, that's, that's, that's outrageous. Um, but I don't know what it is. This is just kind of playing with the music history canon. Do you guys have any fresh ideas? What you would like to see in music history courses that you are taking or will be taking at your, um, at your academic programs? Uh, I guess in a way I'm asking for advice. What would you like to see an old Florida music historian like me fall for you guys? Um, this isn't really a suggestion, but more kind of like a thought. Um, we had a lot of conversations in my music theory class at the end of the semester about um, representation and everything because our curriculum was shot by coronavirus. so we could just talked. Um, and we listened to a lot of black composers from the 19th, uh, from the 20th century. And my teacher was like, I've never heard of a lot of these people before, before I started doing the research. And they have these really impressive resumes, like they've won awards and their resume is just as impressive, if not more impressive than a lot of the composers that we typically know who are white. And just thinking about like, why is that? Someone who has great music and has done all these amazing things and a music theory professor doesn't even know them because of their race. I, 
I feel like um, also it could be interesting to talk about um, not just more recent Black composers, but like through the centuries, I guess. Um, someone was telling me about, I think it's St. George, who was um, a composer and conductor when Mozart was alive. And he wrote a lot of concertos and stuff that are really fantastic. And I feel like they get completely overlooked. But I had no idea that this musician even existed. I feel like it was completely left out of my historical education, as well as like, like I think the most it ever touched on black composers was they mentioned William Grant still because I went to Oberlin. But other than that, I feel like it could be interesting to go from, you know, classical music all the way through modern times, just like the arc of black composition, I guess. I think there are a lot of composers, historical composers uh, of color, uh, of some kind of diverse backgrounds, uh, who really deserve to be better known. And uh, uh, what it proves to us is, I don't know, I guess it's a, we tend to be myopic and we just look at, at things that have been there always, you know, Mozart and Beethoven, uh, without expanding. And uh, I think that's a really good point. And says George, I just loaded up on all the bibliography available on, on him and some recordings. And uh, that's a major force, really important. Uh, if I might chime in real quick, uh, one of the most interesting courses I took this last year was actually an ethnomusicology course. And um, I'm a DMA candidate right now, um, but thinking back, I really wish that in my undergrad or in the history, music history survey classes, that there was more emphasis on ethno or more exposure to ethnomusicology or ethnomusicologists. Um, I don't think it's efficient to really just, not saying it's it, that we shouldn't be incorporating more diverse composers or um, musicians in our history survey classes but if we could talk more about ethnomusicology and hopefully inspire a curiosity in students to go and really hunt for this information on their own um, i think then we could be planting the seed there for more change perhaps um, but in short i wish i knew about ethnomusicology a little sooner in my career um, because it is really really fascinating um, learning about the ethics of you know, being able and learning how to lend your voice to um, to speak for people who may be more underrepresented or unable to speak for themselves. I think that's terrific. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, uh, we're debating this at Colorado College right now, uh, although we've had an ethnomusicology requirement for all of our undergraduates for quite a few years. And uh, some of them complain about it bitterly, and some of them just love it. They say this is the high point of my of my coursework. Sue Cahill, are you still there? I think your hand is raised. That's that's an old an old oh. raise. Uh, okay. Yes, sorry. I will okay. I will unraise my hand. Okay. <laughs> just FYI, everybody, I just put up a. One of our former CC fellow alum actually named Mary Grace Johnson. She's a violinist. I don't know where she is now, but she just put a post on Facebook um, about a, a, a website that's funded by the Rachel Barton Pine Foundation. Rachel Barton Pine is a violinist and uh, it's musicbyblackcomposers.org. And uh, it's a good source and has some good uh, pedagogical um, sources. And so check it out. I have to say, just as, as one of the performers, an old guard that works in the chamber music, it's been baby steps, but in many of the series I've been playing in or festivals, there has been increased diversity, definitely, in the programming. Uh, I just finished a recording of quintets by Louise Ferenc. You know, a lot of it is um, myself and uh, my colleagues, we're just becoming aware of a lot of stuff that weren't really part of our training. And I'm, I'm discovering an incredible amount of repertoire that's 
um, so beautiful that I wasn't even aware of before. So I, I think, and I'm learning this, I'm, I'm recommending it to other places I play. I mean, there is some sort of uh, accretion going on right now that, that at least is, is positive. Uh, yeah, just that, that reminded me what, what John said is um, something else that I think is uh, will be very helpful to all of you guys going forward. Um, and is it even being asked of us now, as, as John was mentioning, presenters are looking for really um, interesting, intriguing programming. And so that's something you, you can think about right now in your schooling. And, and Michael, what you were saying, maybe that's a, a project, um, a musicology project that would be useful as they enter the profession is really thinking about programming um, and and bringing to light music that has you know has been underrepresented, um, representing a point of view, coming up with a thematic program that um, that you're really excited about that includes things known and lesser known. Um, there's a real I, I would say the presenters are almost to the point of hiring interesting programs over famous artists. Um, they will still hire Yo-Yo Ma, but you know, um, but when they're looking at younger groups, a lot of times it's, it's the more interesting programs that, they'll, that they will buy and that they will hire. Um, so I encourage you guys to think about that even now. Um, come up with some on your own, even if it's theoretical. <laughs> um, and, and that also, uh, another plug for, making sure that, that you guys spend plenty of time, uh, I sound like a broken record, but, but figuring out what music you believe in too, because it, it won't help you if you just program things because you think it's gonna be popular or sell, or uh, we need this for diversity. Play music that you believe in, um, that you think is artistically worthwhile and really speaks to you. Um, because if, if, if you don't, I, I can tell you, it will lead to uh, burnout. Um, you, need, you need music that you know that you're so excited about because just because on pure musical values. Um, and if it has additional context that can be brought in and connections, all the better, all the stronger. But it's got to have that artistic purpose. It's curious that uh, Sue, my wife, has always wanted to have one program on the faculty chamber music series of music by living composers or nearly contemporary music. And, uh, and I always used to warn her, look out, the audience is gonna hate this. They're gonna say it's ugly modern music. Don't do it. You know, be sure to throw in some Mozart and Beethoven just to <laughs> ease the pain. And traditionally that's been one of the most popular concerts. And curiously, not just by young people, but by a lot of the elder people in our audience. They come and they're just dying to hear music by living composers. And uh, so I think, Phil, that's a, that's a really great thought to, for all of us to keep in mind. Well, I have to say a plug to Sue Grace and <laughs> because, you know, she's been doing those programs for years. And at first I was like, I, how are these programs going to fly? You know, I, I just, she, she's a, a bold, brave uh, programmer and music um, head here because I, I give her so much credit. You know, I think of, you know, I live in New York City and I play a fair amount of Carnegie Hall and it's a tough sell there. You know, it, we sell our audience every time we program Beethoven 5. And this, it, it's amazing even in this day that still that audience wants a certain specific repertoire and it's of the classical repertoire. So, you know, um, with the groups I play, um, we're always looking at, at other venues. Um, it, it's a big pushback at Carnegie Hall to, you know, you, you have to sneak that little contemporary piece in or that, you know, but now, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's like a double-edged sword because a lot of the people who are on the boards and the presenters are knowing they can't stay the way they've been. They just can't, you know, because people, all you young people <laughs> are speaking out. I mean, it's so great to see this change. I, I feel actually strangely hopeful. And as John Novacek was saying, 
I've gone up and down with my mental state. You know, sometimes get, I just get so sad I'm not playing, but other times I just feel like more hopeful than ever. It's very strange about that we have to embrace life, we have to enjoy life, and life will continue. And hopefully with your help that it will continue to evolve and that places like Carnegie Hall might have a whole evening of contemporary music someday. But um, the Colorado Festival is definitely cutting edge, partially to Sue Grace and the audiences are coming. So um, it's just to know when, when you need to take that courage and say, this is what I believe in. As Phil has been saying, I, I completely concur. It has to be authentically something you believe in. Um, and again, I'd love to hear from more of you, you know, what, what you love, what you love to play. And, um, and if it's all classical Bach, which I've been playing a lot of, that's fine too. Then there are ways to even take older music and bring it to audiences that haven't heard it, you know. So um, all of these are just things to think about. And um, I, in a strange time, with this strange president, I'm still feeling very hopeful because I've always believed that things happen from the bottom up, that we can't just rely on the, the government and the top person making everything good on the way down. I feel like it's all, it, I feel it's all our responsibility to put our passion towards things um, moving forward and turn off the news. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's passion and and excellence, and uh, a belief in what you're doing, and uh, an an uh, an open armed feeling towards the audience wherever they may be. Man, that is gonna sell. It always was excellence, and even though there are a lot of people who uh, prefer to eat at McDonald's, it's not excellence. And uh, it, all you got to do is look around that little town when you stop. And look for the mom and pop place, do a little research, ask anybody who lives there who really knows how to make some food that's worthwhile. It won't even cost any more. Mm -hmm. And it's better for everybody concerned. Uh, and that happens with music too. It's excellence and your passion about it. Find what you believe in and, and go for it. If I may, yeah, Sue's great. <laughs> Um, if I interject, uh, I was been in a couple of meetings uh, so far in Zoom unrelated to Colorado, and they've just had people speak about what's been going on in the Times. And something that was very interesting, I heard someone say, a friend of mine that I've played with a lot, who's a cellist, he said, you know, someone brought up, he goes, uh, what do you think, you know, the schools should be doing and, you know, what should, you know, what, what is Juilliard doing? What is uh, Cleveland Institute doing to change up the programming? And he said, you know what, I don't care. You know, the institutions, it's not, I, I don't care what they do. It's up to the person. It's up to the individual. And if you want to be an upstanding person within society, you make the change. Don't wait for other people to make changes for you. And um, I'm thinking about, you know, how to program more diverse composers. And on a certain level, I do believe we have to put them up, you know, with our Mozart concertos. You learn them side by side. You, go, you find what we find in Mozart so intriguing. You find it in those pieces. It's there. You just have to look. Uh, and it's up to you as a performer and as either a young person or an older person, whatever. It doesn't matter you as a human are responsible for taking care of other humans, not institutions, not worrying about, you know, what people think, it's, it's you. And that was the, what I took away from that conversation. And you know, he's not, he's my age, he's a young guy, he's 25 years old. And he just spoke with such profundity and nuance and care that it just really resonated with me. And I've been enjoying this conversation so much, even if I've been sitting on the sidelines and just listening to what people are feeling and what they're thinking. Um, uh, thank you for this. It's inspiring to hear other people's, you know, input, you know, anecdotes, and even, it, and to hear 
from all walks of life, all from all parts of the country. Um, I'm a little bit spoiled. I've seen, I grew up in New York City and I grew up in, you know, working class neighborhood. So I, I, you, you see it all. And, um, you know, but then again, you know, as my position in society as a, you know, cisgender white male, I have, which is total fact, I'm, you know, more privileged. And just to hear people who are not, who do not look like me speak, because if you look at the canon, um, I can see my face in all the classical composers. And so it's so nice now that we have these resources to see, you know, n new people, new faces, new music. Uh, and I find it's, as Miss Mann said, you know, it's, you know, a ray of sunshine to look for the future, uh, to look to the future. and. It, it, it makes, I know you can't see me right now, but I'm smiling because it makes me happy that it's, it, it is a reality and it will one day be a reality. Uh, so thanks. I love that so much, Peter. Thank you. Um, yeah, I totally agree. And I have to add that um, I, I've never been more inspired to be an up and coming <laughs> classical musician and that I, I can't, I think it's, it's an opportunity to be really creative with oneself um, in one's own head, <laughs> um, practicing every day, thinking about how I'll ultimately be able to use these, these things in a career with other creative individuals. It's really, really exciting. And you know, I was just thinking like, um, I'm sure all of you know who, if you don't, you should. Uh, sorry to be that person, but Valerie Coleman. Um, and I was lucky enough when I was a younger flutist to work with her. And she's always been so kind and loving. And now that we're all like experts at Zoom, um, wouldn't it be like awesome to get these composers who are living to come in on like Zoom classes and talk, you know, just what inspires them just you know it doesn't have to be you know to tokenize them but you know just to hear what they have to say and you know just talk about i don't know you know the weather it you know to make everyone human which i think is the message of today everyone just wants to be treated like a human and so often and in particularly in these days i feel like humanity has gone out the window and um, it, that makes me sad, but again, I'm still smiling because I can think of all the wonderful things that have happened, you know, the small steps that, you know, the United States has been taking to make things more fair and more equal and more inclusive to, and it's just, it's again, you know, it's hope for the future, but uh, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Wonderful, wonderfully said and heartfelt, meaningful stuff. I wanted to tell a very quick story. I don't know how apropos this is. Uh, many years ago, I went, I went three times to Colombia, uh, South America, to do a kind of a Sistema program like, like Ginny was talking about that Scott Yu was involved in uh, helping to start it. And it was an incredible experience for, for those of us, uh, mostly um, um, people who were uh, coming not out of poverty and not coming from minority situations. We donated our time. We went down for, for two weeks to work with 20 um, incredibly beautiful young, uh, mostly string players in, uh, in Medellin, our little, the little village near Medellin. And uh, the story is about one incredibly gifted and beautiful young man, cellist, who uh, was told by the local drug cartel that he had to murder someone from another group that wasn't filling in, fitting in, not uh, selling the drugs that he was supposed to be selling, not keeping up with the status quo that the drug cartel was wanting him to do. And uh, the person who was uh, running the, 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 the red system, the Sistema there, went to speak to that uh, drug cartel leader and said, 
you can't have this boy as part of your group. He can't kill anybody. He's a cellist. He teaches music in the, in our system and he is 14 or 15 years old and, and uh, he's a part of a chamber ensemble and a small orchestra and we need him. And the drug cartel said, guy says, oh, I didn't realize he was a musician. Good luck to him. I'm telling everybody, hands off. He's free to do that and it's good for our society and we support it. So it's the wildest story and beautiful story. And the kid is fine, He's grown up and still, still playing. I'd like to put a, a, a plug or just to let everybody know because there was a lot of interest in conversations like this and I'm just so delighted that we've been able to do this. Um, there's another class that you probably got an email about on Monday, I think it's at noon, um, and it's um, an, more about just art in our society and social justice and it's led by um, a fellow who I did a couple of works on one of those wonderful contemporary concerts here at Colorado College. His name is Idris Goodwin, and he is an American playwright, rapper, essayist, and poet. He's an awesome guy, and he's going to lead the conversation about art in general. There should be some music specification, but also kind of just the art world and safe and opening cultural space. Uh, Ayun Huang, one of our faculty member, and Kevin Cobb will be on that panel as well. So I highly recommend if you're interested to, to check it, that out as well. That's on Monday. And I think maybe we're sort of towards the end of our time, unless anybody else has something else to contribute. This has been, thank you to Liz and my faculty and, and mostly to all of you for your contributions. It's been terrific. Thanks, Jimmy. All right, are we good? Terrific. All right. Keep it up. Keep it up. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Yeah, thanks. You've been an inspiration. Thank you so much.